All right, welcome everyone. This is our another cohort call. Today we have four great speakers who are gonna talk about the open source development and open science in general. So this is our first module of three open science modules. Uh, some of the logistics again, please uh, describe by writing your name, starting with S or W, if you prefer being in a spoken or written breakout room, please make a choice for one to make it easy for us to assign to one room. We have an author live transcription uh, going, so you would be able to click on the link on the top of your screen and um, watch it work its wonder. Another thing things to um, just take a few notes on that we have a code of conduct that applies to this call. So if at all anything that you would like to report, uh, please email to team and at openlifesci.org. You can also reach out to Bernice, Amy, or I separately uh, if you would prefer to reach out to a single person. So there's a huge uh, announcement today. Uh, we have been running a poll for naming your cohort. So our first cohort was called Open Sesame. Our second cohort was called Mass Cohort. And now we have Perseverance Cohort. So this is your name. You will be known forever as Perseverance of Open Life Science. So thank you for polling. With that, I will hand it over to Bernice to take you through what we're going to cover today. So welcome everybody. So thanks, Malvika, for starting the call. So today we will discuss, we will be, it will be our first call about open science. And we will discuss most uh, the project management skills during development stage. So there will be many, so there will be three calls on open science. So this call will mostly focus on open source um software open hardware soft app sorry open source hardware open data um but it's one yeah it's the first call there will be more aspect covered during the next calls i think there is a it's yeah the other two calls that will happen the next the next three two calls Sorry. Um, so the first call will be about the first uh, speakers will talk. So Renato will speak about agile and iterative um, project management methods. So I will end in to Renato. Renato, are you here? Do you want to share? Yep, I'm here. Let's see if my internet collaborates. And uh, can you give me permission? Yeah, can you try again? Let's give it a try. Okay, can I get some thumbs up if you can see yes. this? You're perfect. So you have now around 10 minutes presentation and then we have some discussion questions. So feel free uh, for the participant to drop your questions in the document. Okay. Thanks. Let's go. All right. So hi, everyone. Um, so first of all, let me just open this by saying that I am not an agile expert. Uh, these are just some techniques that I, that I tend to use uh, often on, on my day to day. Um, and and we will explain a little bit what this is and, and how you can benefit from using this. So first of all, what is um, Agile? So Agile is a bit of a principle or a framework to, to organize and structure projects. It's a, let's, let's, let's call it a project manager or a pro project management uh, technique. Um, if, if you're one of these people that tend to have a lot of post-its around with tasks to do and so on, you're probably already even using some of the techniques that the, the Agile movement inspires. Um, but to perhaps keep it a bit more uh, focused on the point, so uh, Agile is something that started uh, in industry. Um, it was mostly driven by um, an intention to deliver a good product to, um, to the customers but at the same time to deliver that product uh, as quickly as possible, uh, even if in a prototype state, um, but at the same time allowing to, um, again, as quick as possible, adapt and, and modify the product to better fit the needs of, of the client. And so as you can kind of, uh, you can kind of see from, from just the, the agile software uh, development manifest, and this was, as I said, was something that started in industry, but uh, specifically in the software world, 
and and the, the 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 kind of like striking point and the reason why it's called agile is is in part because of this uh, want. I don't know if you can see my mouse cursor, uh, Mavika. Can you maybe give me a thumbs up? No. Okay. Then let's see if I can do this. Can you see it now? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Awesome. So, so what I was pointing to is um, responding to change. This was one of the aspects that um, kind of motivated to to give this name to to the movement or to the framework, um, and and agile in the sense of being very fast and 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 kind of um, responsive to to requests and changes. And so you might, uh, if you if you look a little bit into what this this framework uh, consists of, or if you compare it with other um, kind of approaches that people use in in the field, you you may encounter these these words uh, waterfall, um, and you might find also um, um, other names for for this kind of iterative uh, process. There's many many different ways that you can structure this, um, and and I'll I'll explain a few in a, in a second. But if you just look at the waterfall uh, kind of concept, you can you can see that it it falls from one stage to the next. The, the key point here is that all of the project plan is kind of defined from the beginning and you just follow along in a, sequ in a sequential fashion. So you can imagine that if at any point during design or at any point during the implementation or one of the later stages, there's something that you need to change about the plan, this process is rather rigid and doesn't really allow this. And so the, the iterative process is a bit more generic or a bit more um, responsive. It typically starts by breaking a larger problem into smaller chunks so that they become more actionable. Um, exactly what small means, this is what differs a lot between different uh, paradigms, but it can be something that lasts a day, it can be something that lasts a few hours. Um, and then you, you do these kinds of sprints or you, you uh, aggregate these tasks into milestones. And and once each milestone is completed, then you reach uh, a stage where, where you have like a first release or a, a prototype of, of the thing that you're trying to accomplish. In, in the case of your OLS project, it can be a milestone. For instance, uh, you have a website to build um, and, and you can think how to break the, that big task into smaller chunks. And um, it could be the, the first article that you write could be the, an example of, of a, a first deliverable. And so to, to sum it up, it's a technique uh, primarily for software development, but we can use it elsewhere and we can go a little bit more into detail of how to actually do that. Um, uh, it's, it's great um, for project management. It helps you visualize the work that you still have to do um, and also to invite others to, to, to join the project as well, because everything is very visible in terms of what needs to be done and, and what has been done. And, and then there's lots, oops, that's, there's lots of variations in terms of how this is structured um, and, and also in terms of advantages over the, the, the traditional waterfall method. So, so I mentioned breaking down things into tasks and, and milestones and so on. Um, and, and I mentioned as well that you could aim for slices of uh, one to two hours, uh, ideally not more than a day or two. The, the reason for this fragmentation is because you want to have a good, a good sense of of progress. It's very often the case that you estimate a task to be one or two hours, and then it turns out that you spend an entire afternoon or something because we get distracted, because there's other things that we didn't really think. And the idea here is that the agile movement will help you structure those things that are outside of the tasks that you're doing, and they just become tasks again that will get picked up later and move to a milestone that you will uh, complete at a later stage. And so to give a, a more concrete example or a real life example, um, if, if you have already explored a little bit of GitHub and if you've perhaps browsed some of the existing projects there, you might see projects like Intermine uh, where in this, uh, in this diagram, each of these gray boxes is, um, sorry for the background noise, each of these, back, uh, each of these gray boxes is um, a version release and the tasks themselves are uh, within uh, each of, of these gray boxes. And in this case, 
milestones. There are several of them. You can see already some estimate of when these would be achieved and, um, and, and also a very colorful interface for, for how, the, how to label things and how to structure, not just in terms of milestones, but also in terms of what these tasks are, are all about. Um, in, a, in a slightly different way or a more um, kind of, uh, so one of the, con one of the paradigms in, in Agile or a more popular one, if you have used um, uh, the Kanban style board where instead of having the versions like, or the milestones, as we mentioned before, you have just the notion of what, what is to be done, what is in progress and, and what is already completed. So this is like a, a simplified version is not so focused on on the software or versions or, or a specific um, milestones or, or goals, but it's more to capture what is actually being active um, worked on. And, and you could do this process within a milestone. So all of the tasks that you now see in the screen could be within one milestone alone. Uh, this, also, this also to say that for GitHub, um, there's uh, some simplifications and, and some automation that you can do. Um, you, we, can, we can talk about that uh, later if you're interested. And so just to, to wrap up uh, some examples, you could have a task that is just to acquire, like in the website uh, context that I mentioned before, uh, one, one big task could be to acquire a domain for that website. And then you can see an example of how to break that task down into f smaller tasks. Or if you have a specific section of the website that you want to create, and, and then you can see that for that, there's perhaps more tasks that need to be completed. And so ideally you would break it down again into, into subsequently smaller steps. Um, I will skip this for, for the sake of time. And um, I, I didn't go so much into the jargon that is involved. I mentioned that there's different sub frameworks, Scrum, Kanban and Extreme Programming are some examples of, of these. They, they all follow the, the agile principles. What changes between them is sometimes how big these tasks are, how big the milestones are, how often you, you kind of do the, the larger loop or the smaller loop for how long you do uh, these things called sprints, which is kind of a way of getting the entire group working collectively in, in a set of tasks. Um, and then just how you structure. But so without going too much into detail on that, it's just different ways of, of handling the workload and, and prioritizing the tasks that you have to do. And, and then to, to finalize, even though as I, I try to be very superficial here as well to kind of give a high level um, introduction to this, to this topic, um, if, you're, if you're doing software development, you will find that uh, all of this probably translates a lot more versions, milestones, and so on. This kind of makes sense. Um, but uh, I, I, I use this personally for, for my own day-to-day -day just to manage tasks that I have to do, things like uh, reporting or planning meetings or anything, anything of this sort. Um, and, and I find that it works rather well. Okay, so I think I'm a little bit over time, but I think I will I will close it there. Thank you, Renato, for your presentation. Um, oh. okay. Yeah. okay, thank you. Um, does anyone have any question for Renato? So feel free to ask them in the chat or put them in the document. Currently, there is no question there. Um, Anyone wants to ask anything? Do you have any question? Okay, so if I could just ask one. Yeah, my, my question is uh, specifically, Renato, how can this be applied on a day-to-day -day basis? So it sounds like that you always have to do it for a big project, but do you have like tips and tricks for day-to-day -day agile development? So I, I don't... I don't have the, the screenshot that I could easily show with all the tasks that I kind of have. But what I do is I try to keep it very colorful, which also keeps me motivated. Um, I try to split up tasks by not just milestones, but for instance, what, what kind of topic they, they are. If I have a, an, a meeting that I want to plan, then I will create a milestone that is that meeting. And this could include, for instance, inviting all the speakers or getting in contact with uh, many people. Um, then. You could also have, for instance, a report that you need to write, and that report could be also a, 
milestone or a task, depending how you break it down. And then within that report, you have, uh, let's say, bullet points of things that you want to write or, to, or that you want to make sure that they are included. And in terms of the of the day to day process, um, you can. So in GitHub, you can also have these little check boxes that you can click within a, a task. So you can do uh, an outline of lots of bullet points and 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 you just go and you start clicking as you as you progress through them. At the end of the day, you can then review what you achieved and sort of plan for the next day what you want to, to pick on again. And it can be the same task, but just a different point in the same task, or um, or it can be a different task depending how, on, on how much time is left. Thank you. So are you using just GitHub for that, or do you have another tool that you would recommend? So I've, I've used Trello in the past. Um, Trello is very, actually the GitHub interface that was in the screenshots was very much inspired in, in the Trello uh, interface as well. But, but nowadays I mostly use not GitHub, but GitLab because we have a GitLab instance uh, running locally. And, and it also has not just a kind of an issue list, but also these boards that you can Kind of move around and you can create uh you can make those colorful labels on on the issues you can turn them into also a some sort of milestone or a category like the, the to do and pending and done and so on but but i find that this is working well you can also have notifications so you can set deadlines on tasks and so on and it sends you reminders when those milestones get uh, get close so it yeah yeah i find it very practical the only discipline that you need to have is to visit it as often as you can because there is a little bit of maintenance in keeping it up to up, up and shiny, so to say. If you if you don't go there too often, then you can imagine that some of the tasks become obsolete, and and some of the things also will need to yeah to be modified or updated if things change. Thank you. Uh, right now, as a question, so do you want to verbalize your question, or do you want me to read it right now? Uh, I, I can do it. Th thanks a lot, Renato, for this presentation. It's very useful. Um, my question was beyond personal use. Uh, have you do you have some tips or, or any experience uh, um, making this uh, uh, part of the community culture in, in a group, for example? I, I found that um, when you have a heterogeneous group, also uh, it can be complicated sometimes to convince people to use this. So I don't know how much how much I can reveal there, but in in my previous group uh, we had that uh, that dilemma at some point. A lot of the communication and all a lot of the the core value within the group was was being sort of organized by email, and this had the disadvantage that there was a lot of work being done that was not really visible, and and at some point we decided to to change this. It was a, a bit of a group effort as well, and and we. We did exactly what I described. So we we moved to GitLab. We started using the GitLab issues. Um, you could do the same with GitHub as well, and it it allowed not just everyone to see what was going on. It also allowed a lot of reduction in terms of duplication of work, and and it create it it also opened up the space to to have some kind of automation for some things. So. We could have, for instance, if you wanted to do a specific task that uh, that the group already had as a core pipeline or some software analysis or something like that, then then you could just create an issue, and and there would be one person specialized on that that would take care of of uh, handling that task. So it also has this this dynamic of um, potentially you could you. So what I'm trying to say here is that you can assign people to categories of tasks or topics. Um, and and then people take responsibility for those, but it, it does need to be a kind of like a common agreement that uh, that everyone will will share a little bit of the load. And in terms of maintenance, once the once you have a core of people uh, kind of coordinating everything the same way, and this is one of the things that you need to agree upon with with all with with your community, then then it runs rather smoothly from my experience. Thanks. Thanks a lot. So thanks, Renato, again for this talk and for answering the question. Uh, so now we move to the next speaker. So the next speaker is Elena. She will talk about open source software. Elena, you have 10 minutes presentation and after questions. Thanks. You are muted. 
I am muted, aren't I? Everyone can see it okay? <laughs> okay, perfect. So my name is Helena Rasha. I've been working in open source for quite some time now. I'm currently employed by the Osmos Medical Center and the Advanced Hochschule in Greda. And I'm here to tell you a little bit about open source in research. So first, what is free and open source software? The term is a bit important because open source software and free software are not necessarily the same things. Free software doesn't mean open. So you can, many of us remember freeware on the internet from when we were younger. This is software where you have no access to the source code and you can't work with it. You can't modify it due to the license. This is not great for science. On the other hand, open source doesn't mean free. So for those of you who are producing research software, just because you're making your software open source, it doesn't mean it has to be free software. And this together, the intersection of these two is often known as free and open source software or FLOS, free slash libre open source software. And this just refers to software that is both open and free. Open source is simply licensing your work so it can be used how you want. Making your software open source is just a matter of setting out the terms of how you want your software to be used. It doesn't mean that you have to give up control of your software. It doesn't mean that you're putting it out to the community forever. It just means you're choosing and saying for yourself, setting boundaries on how you want your software to be used. So it's a very important step all the time. For those who want, the open source also makes it easy for others to remix your software, to reuse it, to build upon your software, add new features if they want. And if you're building a project where community is important, where you want your software to be used by a lot of people, making it open source in such a way that people can reuse and work with you can be a really great boost for your software, just in terms of visibility and people who want to use it, things like that. So why use and promote open source? Open source is part of the ethics of um, scientists and hackers a little bit. When you're writing the software, when you're working on projects together, a lot of the libraries you use for Python, things like this, if you're using different programming languages, a lot of the libraries you use will be open source. You're benefiting from a lot of work that other people have done so far. And it's a nice feeling to collaborate and give back now you've built your software or your project on years and years of free work that was produced before and now you're giving back to the community it also means distributed innovation so when you're making software open source and free so that other people can work on it this means that other people will give back contributions they'll report bugs when they have issues running your software they'll tell you new features that they want you don't have to implement them, but you're able to take all of these good ideas from the community and things like this. Importantly for science, open source is easier to review, reuse, and integrate. And when we talk about open source and science, if you want your software to be distributed widely, to be used in a lot of systems, one of the best things you can do for it is licensing it in such a way that everyone can use it and set it up on their own system. Things like Galaxy, so I'm of course very biased here and we'll talk a lot about Galaxy, but in the Galaxy community, we can give a huge platform of, you know, on Use Galaxy EU, 30,000 users to free source. It's free advertising, but we can only do that for open source software. There are a lot of risks associated with closed code too. When you have closed source software that's used in science, you can't review it very easily. The community can't review it very easily. Only the reviewers of the paper sometimes. And if there are errors in the software, if there are bugs, then these can be missed for years and years. And these will affect a lot of scientific results downstream. So having open source reviewable software, it's very important for reproducible, good quality science. A lot of the journals are adapting this and starting to require disclosure or uh, publishing of your source code for all of your software too. This is from a scientific perspective, really a good thing for the community. So how do you know if something is open source? You'll see on a lot of GitHub repositories, which I think everyone here is familiar with, thanks to OLS, is a little license icon on the right hand side of the repository. Also on things like slides, you can see the CC by of these, this slide deck at the top. You can look for a couple of different files within the license and these files need to be there if it's going to be open source software that you can reuse. But it's not just for software. I know I talk a lot about software, but it's also for data. 
There are different licenses for data for things like databases that you want to make accessible for photos or training materials, things like this. All of these are options. And if you want people to be able to use them, you need to license it. One of the common fears I hear about a lot is if I publish my software online, if I do it in the open, it'll be, I'll be scooped. Someone will take my software and claim it's their own. But this isn't necessarily true. If someone steals your software, there is at least a traceable log in GitHub, or which we'll get to in a minute. Um, there is a copy of your software already online. That, and if you already have a community around that, it'll be very obvious that someone took it. And if you're still worried, I've heard some people saying that they publish preprints as a way to document that, hey, they were first to write the software and to really make sure they stake their claim on that software. Um, so don't worry about that. Just work in the open. It's better for the community. It's better for the world and it's good for science. Publishing, sharing open source code. One of the easiest and most effective ways to do this is version control. I'm sure you're all learning about Git and GitHub if you haven't already but version control is a fantastic way to publish and share code with others. It gives you a whole timeline of your software and it makes it easy to reuse, contribute and make modifications to your software. So why? Collaborating is easy. One of the common things is reverting accidents. If you make some bad changes in your code or one of your collaborators does, you can always revert. You can always go back to before then. It makes it easy to integrate the changes from multiple developers. Like with Galaxy, there are some 200 contributors to the code base or the training materials as well. And all of us can work together collaboratively because we use version control. Also offsite copies of your software. Everyone has computer issues. Everyone loses a hard drive at some point or gets their hard drive encrypted by some hackers, things like this. If you have all of your work in the open and public, then you can just download a new copy again and start working again. Git and GitHub are very common, a very common choice. Git is one of the most common version control systems. There are others. GitHub likewise is one of the most common Git hosts, but there are others. Um, depends on what you want to use. One of the nice things you get with GitHub is a large existing user base and large community of people who will be able to contribute to your software. It's a low barrier for entry. If you need to learn more about Git, there is a great uh, set of lessons from the software carpentries. But one of the important notes is that Git is very, very complex. My partner teaches a um, Git together session where they teach how to use Git to the colleagues in our office. And there's just so much to learn about Git, but you don't need to learn all of it now. Just start with the important parts. The rest comes later. There, you'll see a lot of guides online that'll say, oh, you need to learn about how the commit graph works and things like this. But if you just want to publish your code, you don't need any of the fancy stuff. So a few steps to make your work open source. A readme is a very important part of this. If you want people to know what your software is and how to start using it, that's the number one thing people will see. So be sure to include lots of good images there. License, if, it has, if it's going to be open source, it needs a license file. So it takes two minutes to add a license with GitHub. It's really easy, just do it. Same with the contributing guide. Uh, GitHub has some template contributing guides that make it really easy to tell people how you want them to contribute to your, uh, to your repositories. Having a public roadmap. We uh, have not talked about the Kanban boards and the Agile. Having a public roadmap is a great way to tell the community what you're working on, what features you're going to implement, things like that. And that can help people get excited for your software. Um, publishing list of issues, same. It feels bad to say, hey, my software has bugs, but at least putting them out in the open, you can track the things you've done or not done. A code of conduct, as I'm sure you've learned from OLS, is a very important thing. Contact and citation can be very useful as well. If you have a GitHub repository, you can easily get those from Zenodo and Figshare if you need a DUI. There's a nice website for how to choose a license. Um, there are lots of different license choices, and they give you a lot of different freedom to choose what you want your software to be able to do or what you want other people to be able to do with your software. Some people don't want businesses to use their software for free, and there are licenses that support this, or some people want everyone to use it for free. Lots of different choices. But the ultimate goal, of course, is full reproducibility. And we're getting a lot closer with things like Jupyter and Binder, where you can publish your software, but also a notebook where people can run your software online 
which is a fantastic way to get people to use your software. Uh, taking it further, there's a lot of ways for you to contribute if you're a first time contributor and to get involved in the open source software movement and contributing to the open source communities. So there are lots of nice links here if you want to explore them. And lastly is the Turing Way has a nice handbook on reproducible data science and making software open source and publishing and making it accessible to people. So with that, thank you. I think I am 30 seconds over time. And thank let you. me know if you have any questions. Thanks a lot, Elena. That's, yeah, great talk. Um, anyone has any questions to Elena about open source software? Feel free to, so I don't see any, oops, sorry. Okay. Um, one event that, so one question for Elena. If you are a new newcomers to open source, which events you will uh, recommend to join to get familiar? Definitely Hacktoberfest, but that's just yeah. because you get a free shirt if you contribute four pull requests, which is always a good motivator. Um, that's one I contribute to every year. I have not participated in the others, like um, what was listed there, the Mozilla Global Sprint or the 24 pull requests. So I don't, I can't speak for those. Maybe you know about Mozilla. So, but I'm not sure if it's still running the Mozilla Global Sprint. Okay. I don't think so. It was for a few years, but I didn't hear enough recently about that. But it was a nice event, global event. But Oktoberfest, definitely. Yes. I liked it, especially because people on GitHub usually label their, their project with uh, um, issues that are easily, uh, that are for newcomers. So it's yes, a nice that's one. a really nice thing that people yeah. do, easy, low-hanging fruit issues that yeah. people can contribute to. Um, there is a question. Can you share some good tips for open source software maintenance? How can we get sorry, how can we get more people learning and contributing to my project? This is a broad question. Um, maintenance is always a long-term topic and depends on your funding structure, of course. But if you can build a community around your project, a lot of that is made easier by doing these things like the uh, code of conduct and the contributing guide. These tell users how they are newcomers, how they can easily contribute to your software. They give you know a point by point guide. The training materials is a good example here. We say, do you want to contribute a training material? Then here are the steps you need to follow. Here are how to set up your environment to contribute. Here are the contributing guidelines. So we need your you know, information. We need it to be spell checked, things like this. Check for the build errors, things that make or that someone can read and say, OK, I know exactly what I need to do to make a really good first time pull request. That's one of the best things that you can do for making your software um, or to start building the community, which will, in the long term, hopefully help people um, maintain and contribute to your project. Uh, learning about your project, this is going to be a matter of having good documentation. And there are a lot of different types of documentation. There is developer documentation. There is um, things like the API documentation. If you write software, what parameters for this function call? Then there's documentation for like tutorials, which are really a different audience completely, but also a necessary part of onboarding people. There are different steps sort of like you want people to know how to use your software in general. So they need sort of training materials to get them started with how to install, how to run, what are the commands, blah, blah, blah. But then you need also the next level for once people get deeper, you need the, uh, the developer documentation. Here's how I can contribute. Here is the structure of my software. Here are the different components that you might be wanting to work with. And then you also need the last level of the API documentation of here are the exact parameters you can call if you want to integrate with this software, that sort of thing. I hope that covers it. There's a good framework or a good a graphic that I found a long time ago that I really like that there's just different types of documentation and they're all important. Just to not afraid everybody, you don't need to have everything yes. from scratch there. You can build that with your community and boarding the people to help you writing this documentation. It's exactly. one aspect there where you can get your community behind that because it can be a bit frightening when you know, when you just think what everything you need to do. Just to be sure that's <laughs> yeah no that's uh, a very good point thank you for emphasizing that it's really yeah. 
you can build it up over time. It doesn't need yeah. to be from day one. Perfect. And one other aspect, so empowering the people. So uh, mentoring them through your, your program that they, from new people, they can become more and more. Yeah, I think it's also there. We are sorry, I'm answering your question. So, what is the next question? So, how can I convert a non open source repository to open source? It's the last question. Then, after okay. we move in, okay, move. sounds good. Um, the first step of this is usually to make sure you remove any secrets from the repository's history. A lot of times, when people have closed repositories, they hard code things like database passwords. Make sure you strip all of those out of the history. And then once you've done that, you can work, you can just make it open and add a license. Adding a license is really the only thing you need to do to make it open source software and publishing it on somewhere like GitHub. After that, everything else is extra. It's decorations on the top. It's nice decoration, but it's not necessary. Thanks for the quick answers. And then I hand in to Amy. Do you? Yep, thank you. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, uh, Marilise and Helena. Um, let's, next, we have uh, Esther, who will talk about open data. Hi, all. Hope you can hear me. Perfect. Thanks. I hope you also see my slides. Perfect. Wonderful. Uh, so hi, Perseverance. I am very excited to be talking to you today about open data, which is one of my favorite topics. Uh, so my name is Esther Plomp. I'm a data steward at the Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands, and I'm also uh, one of the mentors of this cohort. Uh, and you can find the link of this presentation uh, in the slide itself, and I should have also uh, pasted the link in the notes. So do let me know if you cannot access it. So open data. What is open data? Open data is any data that's made freely available for use and reuse by anyone and everyone. So what does that mean? It means that uh, everyone should have access to the data. So it should be available on the internet uh, for anyone to access on demand. Uh, everyone must be able to use, reuse, and redistribute uh, that data. So participation is also very important here. It should also be transparent what kind of information or what kind of open data you're accessing. So there should be some information about data generation and collection and about the data. Um, in terms of reuse and distribution, uh, that's very important for open data. Uh, you should be able to redistribute data uh, without a lot of restrictions. And we'll get back to that later. And open data should also be interoperable. And uh, that means that you can integrate it or link it to other data. And uh, if you do that in a machine readable uh, format, it's easy to do that automatically. So these definitions uh, are from the Open Data Handbook and the World Bank, and I uh, pasted those links in the slides. So do have a look at those websites if you want to learn more about the terminology. Uh, what is open data not? Or um, yeah, just to highlight uh, that the sentence data will be available upon request uh, is not a good sign in terms of open data. So I'm sure we've all uh, seen this sentence. Uh, in a publication where the author uh, states that, sure, if you email me or if you call me, I will provide you the data. Uh, so that's not open because you can't actually access it by yourself. Uh, you would have to go through the author. Uh, and uh, a study by Vines and colleagues has indicated that that is not as easy as it sounds. Uh, you can email researchers, uh, but because we tend to hop uh, institutes, we change our email addresses quite frequently. So a lot of the time, it's going to be difficult to contact a researcher. Uh, so their conclusion in their paper was then also uh, that research data cannot be reliably preserved by individual researchers, uh, which might uh, sound a bit harsh, uh, but to be fair, I don't think we should be asking individual researchers uh, to preserve data for the long term. That's why we have data repositories. Um, what is also not open data is fair data. Uh, so this is a term that's been used increasingly in the data world, uh, but is actually not the same as having data that is open. So fair 
uh, means findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And what does that practically mean? Uh, I put some links into the slide where you can look it up in detail, um, but I'm going to do it very briefly right now. Uh, so findable means that your data is findable on a data repository uh, with some uh, metadata, so information about the data, uh, and a persistent identifier. And this persistent identifier ensures that you do not end up with a broken link. So that means that your data is going to be uh, accessible as well. So accessible uh, is, seems kind of like it's open, uh, but that's not actually uh, what accessible in the word fair is about. Accessible means that there's a procedure in place that allows you to obtain access to the data, potentially. Uh, your access can still be declined, but there should be a procedure in place. Uh, so this is where it's different from open data. It's not necessarily open. It can be, but not necessarily. Um, but here also we see that interoperable plays an important part of FAIR. And your data is interoperable when you use open formats. So uh, formats that anyone can use, such as PDF, uh, instead of uh, Word documents, for example. Not everyone has a Word license uh, and can't, can just use that software. Um, but also if you use commonly used vocabulary or standards uh, to describe your data. Uh, that means it's more easy to integrate it with other data and more easily understandable for others. The same goes for reusable. If you want your data to be reusable, you should document it well uh, so that others can interpret the data. And in order to do that, it uh, has already been mentioned for software, but the same goes for data. Uh, you can set up a README file. And I put, uh, put two examples of README files uh, in the presentation. So do please have a look if you want an example of that. And also there are things such as data dictionaries or codebooks. That's a little bit more um, elaborate in comparison to a README file, uh, but that's also very good practice to document your data uh, so that others can actually reuse it. And then uh, what is also the same for data as for code, in order for it to be reusable, you need a license. And for data, uh, the most commonly used licenses are the Creative Commons licenses. So we do use different licenses than software because uh, data and software are different um, objects. It functions a little bit different. So I would not recommend using the Creative Commons uh, license for software, but for data, this is standard practice. Uh, and uh, the license chooser for software was already linked before. Uh, this, I, I'm actually linking to the same one because it's a very nice website. Um, but for data, we now also have uh, a license chooser. So you can go to the link in the slides uh, to check that out. So just to briefly also introduce what a license is. It's basically a sort of standardized contract that tells anyone uh, what they can do with your data. Uh, so they don't have to ask you what you allow them to do with it. And that's actually why it's very important to have this license out there in the open, because if your data or your software doesn't have a license, it means no one can actually use it without asking you. So this is why it's very important to have that license. Um, <laughs> getting distracted by the chat. I'm not looking at that right now, sorry. We'll get to it later, hopefully. Um, Right, open data uh, has uh, CC0 or CC BY licenses. Um, this means that there's not a lot of restrictions uh, for the reuser of your data. So for example, CC0 or the public domain uh, allows the reuser to do basically anything with your data and they don't even have to attribute you. So they don't necessarily have to cite you. Uh, that is good practice though. So I would recommend to cite your uh, sources, but if you would like to enforce that a bit more, you could use the CC BY license. Uh, so that allows the same things as you can see in the slides uh, as the public domain, uh, but it also ensures that the reuser should cite you or credit you. And then the further down you go uh, with these licenses, you see that they get a little bit more restrictive. So for example, uh, the CC BY non-commercial non-derivative, uh, the one at the very uh, bottom of this list, 
That one does allow you to copy and publish um, the data, but it doesn't allow for commercial use and you can't actually uh, modify and adapt it. So this is not really open data in a sense because there's a lot of restrictions that are placed on the data. Uh, but in any case, if you want to choose that license, that is of course up to you. And also just a highlight here, if you're not sure what license to choose uh, for your project and you want to share data, uh, please also feel free to contact me if you uh, just want to ask or just have a chat about it. Then, um, something which I find very important is that it's not just about the access to the data and the redistributing the data. Um, so I pasted two of my uh, favorite quotes uh, regarding open science on the slides, uh, which is that there's no open science if science is not open to all. And that's a quote from the uh, blog post, bro open science is broken science and can recommend to read that one. Uh, and also the quote, including more ways of knowing and understanding our common world within the great scientific conversation would enrich and diversify its collective ideas and creativity for the common good. And that quote is from Open Science Beyond Open Access. And that's a report which I also highly recommend that you read. Uh, so it's really not just about having access to things. I think open data is really about um, anyone allowing to participate in the creation uh, and generation of that data as well, uh, because otherwise I don't think it's truly open. And if you want to learn more about that, uh, there's the data equity framework by We All Count. And uh, there is a webinar on data justice talk story, which I recommend, and a book on data feminism um, by Catherine D'Ignacio and Lauren Klein. So they go a little bit more into the topic on uh, why it's important that everyone can participate. And then I also listed some additional resources. Um, Paula Andrea Martinez gave a similar presentation to this one last year for uh, core two, and it's a really good presentation. So do have a look. And if you want to um, really participate in open data, uh, and you want to get more involved, I can recommend joining the Research Data Alliance, which is a global research community uh, to, that really um, wants to increase awareness and facilitate uh, sharing of data. So this is a great way to uh, get in touch with colleagues and um, get involved through initiatives and working groups and do some really practical stuff as well in terms of data sharing. Uh, of course, the Turing Way uh, already been highlighted, uh, but it has an open research or reproducible research chapter, uh, so you can also find more information there. And the Open Data, open data Handbook uh, by the Open Knowledge Foundation. And then if you, uh, you're running out of time and you don't want to uh, read full data books and presentations and all these things, I listed two blogs. Uh, 10 Arguments Against Open Science That You Can Win uh, by Movica. And I'm not necessarily saying that uh, you need to be an open data evangelist, but if you're hesitant about sharing your data, uh, this is also a good blog to read and to maybe reconsider why you're hesitant about this. And I also wrote a short blog about how can you make research data accessible. So I'm shamelessly plugging that. And this blog is a bit more practical in terms of how you can actually make your data open. So we can't really go into that right now because time restrictions. But if you have any questions regarding that, please uh, let me know. Um, yeah, I'm in your Slack channel. I'm one of the mentors. So I think that's the easiest way to find me. Uh, but I'm also on Twitter or you can send me an email. Um, and I think you might be able to tag me on your GitHub repos. Not 100% sure, but happy to answer uh, any questions there as well. Thank you, and that was it. Thank you. I know you have to run soon, so I'll keep it short. Uh, so please leave your questions in the Google Doc. Um, if we don't have time now, I'm sure we can uh, get around to offering them in a minute. But one quick one. Alexander asked, uh, do you have any experience with the open data common licenses? Open data common licenses? Yeah. Let me look at the Google Doc as well. <laughs> Sorry. 
is the, do you mean the same thing as uh, the Creative Commons license, or is this a separate? Let me check the website. It's from the Open Knowledge Hi. Foundation. Yes, sorry. No, they are they are very very similar, but but not are not the same. These licenses are more for data. They are not very used, but I think they are more focused on on data, on open data. To be honest, I haven't heard of them, so I'm happy to check that out later. But yeah, there's multiple licenses and just a Creative Commons license. So yeah, thanks for sharing. Thank you. We we learn we learn new things every single time we have this presentation, which is great. I'm sorry, folks. Uh, I think Esther, do you, you don't. I'm assuming you have to run. So I, I can do five more minutes. Unfortunately, I have to go to another workshop, <laughs> so I can't be in the breakout rooms. But again, please do contact me on Slack if you want to have like a second pair of eyes going over your data or your license or uh, whatever. If uh, you have more questions or if you're watching the recording. Okay, let's do, let's do as many of this as we can before you have to run. <laughs> uh, uh, asks, um, she understands that fair is not enough to make data open, but isn't it a requirement that open data are fair? Preferably, yes, uh, because the fair principles really do uh, yeah, increase reuse and they're not really, um, they're not really inhibiting each other. So um, if preferably, yes. But the other way around, then yeah, it doesn't work so much. So that answers the question. Thank you. Um, and Teresa asks, where is the best uh, place to store your data? Uh, is it public databases to make it findable? What yeah. So there's um, there's a bit of debate. What is, of course, the best place? So if you have a disciplinary specific repository, I would recommend you to uh, deposit your data there. Uh, because that's the place where your colleagues are going to look for the data. Uh, so that's the, the best place to do it there. If there's no disciplinary specific repository, which is very highly the, likely the case because not every discipline uh, or every subfield has its own repository, uh, then you can use a general uh, repository. And one of the examples is for uh, Zenodo, uh, but also Figshare. Um, and there's, yeah, there's a couple of others. In that case, I would recommend to use a repository that really assigns these persistent identifiers uh, because that makes your data more uh, discoverable and also it allows others to cite your data and it's persistently available. Um, so those are, I think, the two main points to pay attention to when you're looking for a repository. And I can share some resources uh, in the notes about how you find uh, a repository. I think it's also in the blog, not 100% sure but I'll share it. Thank you so much, Esther. That would be amazing. All right, folks, if you have any more questions for Esther, uh, you can put them in Slack, of course, and she gave us a, a follow-up as well. Thank you so much. Um, and I'll uh, see you soon, hopefully. <laughs> um, we now have a breakout room. So this is going back a little bit to um, the first talk that we had today on interactive project management and design. So the breakout room will be uh, 10 minutes. And um, just a small reminder before we start, uh, if you haven't already done so, please, we'd really appreciate it if you can rename yourself with a W or an F before your name. So we know where to put you. I think most people have done that actually. Um, 10 minutes, uh, there are sort of a, it's sort of a two part uh, task. So the idea is that we would like you to break down your first milestone into achievable chunks. So that's what you're going to do for the first five minutes, um, working silently on your own. Um, you can use the Google Doc to take notes as you do this. So that's from page 10 onwards. Um, you can see spaces for your notes. So after five minutes of breaking down your first milestone, um, share with uh, your group what you find interesting and or challenging. So if you are um, sharing in a spoken discussion room, you can, of course, freely amongst yourself. Um, if you are sharing in a written discussion room instead, we might to ask you to please keep your conversations written. This could be done either in the Zoom chat, nobody else would be able to see it other than the people in the room. Um, you could use the Zoom chat or on the Google Docs notes where you know, everyone else would be able to see it. So just to keep in mind. 
I hope that's clear and I think we'll be to in are yeah. we ready? Yeah, so the spoken rooms are room one, two, and three, and rest of you all are in the written room. And I'm opening the room. Here you go. You can see a pop up on the screen now. Um. I think we're all. So uh, hope you all had a good discussion um, uh, and uh, some interesting experience breaking down um, your first milestone into achievable chunks. Does anyone want to sort of verbalize um, some of their thoughts on what you found interesting or challenging in the process? Please feel free to unmute yourself if you want to. Yeah, go ahead, Anna. Hey, y'all. Morning, afternoon, evening. Um, I think one of the challenges which I had on my first uh, milestone was really learning what I did not know. Um, so I think going into it, I'm like, oh, GitHub, I can do this, this, and this. And then it opened up like 20 other doors of more questions and excitement and um, being like, oh, there's a lot more parts which I really need to fill in to make this a complete project. So I think the deeper I get into these milestones, the more I realize how much I could actually flush them out. And that's tough, but rewarding, I guess, more work. Ah. <laughs> yeah, thank, you. thank you so much. Uh, yeah, no, I, I feel you. <laughs> If it, does anyone have any tips to share as to how to make this a bit more manageable? Or just anything that you um, find challenging or interesting as well in that process of breaking things down? I'm, I'm checking the notes as well and I see that folks have mentioned, you know, uh, uh, it's a bit of a chicken and egg problem that you have, um, you first have to have an idea, um, but then with, without the user's needs, you can't really have the idea. So it's also a bit of that, that iterative process of going back and forth between the problem and the solution and the problem. And so, yeah, um, it's great that you noticed that. So that's, that's really great to see that. I hope you find this process uh, rewarding nonetheless, despite the fact that uh, it could feel like a little bit of a circle at some time, but I'm I assure you, you're moving forward in in many ways that you you don't you're not aware of at this present time. Um, but yeah, uh, so if you have um, some I? time, yep. Sorry, do. I just would like to make a comment to that uh, problem, also of like learning all these new techniques and tools. This might be a great way of onboarding new people to your project, right? Maybe you know somebody who's an expert in your department that already knows GitHub. And what seems to be like a big task for you, it's like a five minute job for them. So you make this very low entry barrier task for them and you get them hooked into your project maybe. That's a wonderful tip. Thank you, Andre. Yeah, it's also very satisfying to be able to help someone. So do pass this wonderful feeling on to other people. Um, Anyone else would like to say something about, about their experience uh, breaking things down? I'm not afraid of the awkward silence, so let's do that for another 10 seconds. <laughs> okay, if not, um, we can, uh, we should go to the next section, but please keep thinking about this. Please keep trying, please keep sharing your experience. Um, I now pass to Malvika. Great, thanks so much, Amy. Um, and I'm very glad that Andre already spoke 
So it makes it easy for me to introduce Andre. Um, Andre is one of the open hardware uh, related mentoring program, which is very similar to OLS and we generally call them our sister program. Um, he's a co-founder of that and he's here to share with you what open, soft, what open hardware means to you, Andre. Hi everyone, uh, thanks for the introduction. Monica. Let me just find my, should have done that before, find my slides, which I actually shared on the document already. Um, so I don't want to use that. Um, yeah. Um, so hello everybody, thanks for the space and time to talk about open hardware, which is something that I'm really uh, passionate about. Um, and I guess I think we start by taking things one step uh, back because we spoke about all of these wonderful initiatives in, in science, right? So we spoke about open data and um, open, uh, open source software, which is more known to everybody. Uh, where's my screen? Here, I hope. Can everybody see my presentation? Okay, cool. Um, and so the point that I'm saying, like trying to make one step back is that without hardware, without equipment, there is no science in a way, right? Like we can download all these amazing data sets, but if you really want to be in control of generating data and like doing, answering exciting questions locally and questions that are important for your science and your community, let's say, then you need the proper tools to do it, right? Um, Movik already introduced me, but hello from my side so that I get started. Um, I work at the University of Sussex where I have a job that really that I really, really like, which is developing open source hardware for the Department of Neurosciences. Uh, I'm also volunteering a lot of my time to Trend in Africa, which is an NGO trying to help development in higher education in Africa. So we do a lot of um, sharing of our knowledge so that people can actually um, build their own tools. We do a lot of workshops. I started a small website called Open Neuroscience and I'm working with Julieta Arancio and Alex Cuchera, as Malvika mentioned on this program that it's similar to open life sciences, but for hardware called Open Hardware Makers. Um, all of this started about, I mean, I think I already spoke about like why open hardware, right? Like we need hardware to do the experiments, the things that we do. And here's just one example in life sciences, right? So if you are, um, thinking about microscopes, which is one of the workhorses inside life sciences, right? These tools are from, they were first developed like in the late 1600s, I think, if I'm not mistaken. And this one that you see on the left is actually from 19, the turn of the 20th century. So 1904 or something. And the one on the right is a little bit more recent. As you can see, like the modern microscope didn't change much over the last hundred years. And still, if you want to get one on the right, you would spend something like 10,000 pounds, right? And I, I mentioned costs because although we really like to romanticize things about science in the end, like we still need to pay for things. Um, and so things, these things are really expensive, although the technology in them didn't change much over the last 100 years, right? So there is something wrong there from my perspective. But even if you don't consider that, if you think about you are, let's say, in the global south, where I'm originally from, um, trying to buy a microscope. Um, you only find distributors from the global north, so you have to import things. They only have their, or they mostly have their clients in the global north in mind. So if I bring it back to my hometown in Brazil, where it was super warm and humid, then like this thing is gonna like rust really fast and probably be out of work. If it breaks, I have no local support. I have no idea what's going on inside because it's a, it's a black box. And as COVID-19 has shown us, our um, supply chains for equipment, for, um, for hey, consumables and all, like they are really fragile, right? Like once like there is a disruption from like China and so on, like everybody gets stalled and things get delayed and so on. And so all of this together makes scientific equipment really slow to innovate right? Because you cannot open, like, I'm not going to fiddle around with a 10,000 pound piece of equipment, right? Like, if I break it, like, the whole department is going to want my head. So, like, I better not fiddle around with that, right? And so, this is why, like, without access to these tools, proper access, there is no science, right? And this is where open source comes in. Um, 
this is these are just a few of examples of open source microscopes that are available today. If you want to find these projects online, right, you could find and reproduce them right away. And the nice thing about them is that all of them are un under a hundred dollars, right? Some maybe actually, let's say all of them are under two hundred dollars, which is like orders of magnitude uh, cheaper than the ones that I just showed you, and they're all portable. Right, so here on the left, um, you have the scale here, which is about five centimeters. This is something we developed in the lab a long time ago and we're using for educational purposes and so on. But you could do like 80% of the stuff that you do in the labs, right? Um, this one next to it is actually very specialized for fluorescence, which is like a fancy method, right? Like in life sciences. But the one that I would like to highlight are these two on like the one left with the yellow one, which is called Open Flexure, which is an amazing project uh, that I really like. I'm not involved with the project myself, but I really like like the project because they're actually made the papers and proved that this actually is able to detect malaria uh, inside blood cells. So the resolution of this is on par with optical microscopes and you can build it for a fraction of the cost and 3D print parts wherever you are. Actually, a lot of the developers for this are in Tanzania, our partner um, developers with the people here in Bath, which is close by to Brighton where I am. And the other microscope on the right is actually about this big and goes on the head of uh, mice and they can actually do live imaging of uh, brain activity while the animals are performing a certain task. And what I think is really crucial about these two examples, this last two that I said is that the yellow one, the open flexure, they actually show that they can do like the same or better performance than actual commercially available microscopes. And the one on the right is actually providing, which is the Miniscope project can actually provide something that wasn't available before. So before the Miniscope as an open project came along, there was no way to have freely moving mice uh, and record their like brain activity with optical imaging, right? And so this brings a lot of innovation. There is a big community around Miniscope just to like pound on the point that the speakers that came before me said that fostering a community and bringing people into an open project actually is good for research, is good for you, and it's good for innovation and like speeding up the cycles in science and research. So I wanted to keep this kind of short. So this is just a slide that Huli made and I adapted um, to show why we should use open hardware. And I hope I have mentioned this already, even if like too fast and, and giving you a lot of information. Uh, but Let's like take step again step by step. So because it's reproducible, so we actually use GitHub and GitHub a lot uh, to put out our projects, uh, our open hardware projects, because it's actually super fun to learn how somebody did something, like how the Miniscope, this amazing project works, right? I can go into the documentation and actually see how they put the boards together, how the electronics work and so on. It's super affordable. So from our experience with people that are um, being part of our workshops in Africa, they say, look, this is affordable enough that here in our institution, we can like pull some resources together and get started with open source hardware. Uh, it's repairable because I know like everything that is going on um, inside the hardware, I can also know how to repair it when something goes wrong, but not even that because I know how everything works. I also know if the data that I get out of it is reliable or not, right? Like, oh, is this PCR? Or is this image from this microscope really what it's supposed to be? Or is it an artifact, right? Because I know how it works, then I know the limitations and the capabilities. And because I know the limitations and capabilities, I know where and how and if I need to customize something, right? So let's say I'm using the open flexure for something, but right now it works on power in the, in the wall socket, right? But I need it with batteries because I know like how it works. I can easily say, okay, if I change this power supply with these batteries, then I can actually bring this to the field and use it outside the lab space or even in a lab where there are constant power failures, right? Um, and putting all of this together, this is then obviously, hopefully if it's done right, it's democratizing, right? Because then it doesn't matter if you are in the global north or if you're doing citizen science or if you are inside academia because you're collecting data with tools that you actually know exactly what they're doing, you can go and say, look, this is my data. This was how it was recorded. And it's, it's, it's good data, right? So we need to discuss data and not whether or not like I have a $10,000 piece of microscope. 
Um, luckily for us, there is what I'm calling like the Cambrian explosion of open source hardware going on. So what you're seeing here are a lot of projects um, that are currently available. Some highlights that I think are really cool, like here on the top left, you can see this little object on the on the palm of a hand. This is an atomic force microscope, right? So this goes down to image like really, really, really tiny stuff, right? So it really measures like uh, nanometers and, and, and things that are really small. Then here um, on the bottom row, you can see the the image where there is somebody holding a little white board. This is actually an EKG machine. And this person actually discovered that like he writes a blog post and I can find the reference later if somebody wants, but he actually finds um, that he has a heart arrhythmia because he was able to play around with um, this EKG and brought it to his doctor and said, look, this is my data. This is how my heart looks like over a 24, 24 hour period. And there is something wrong here, let's fix it, right? And it could have been that he would never like know about this, but I think it's interesting that people have the empowerment to like know what's going on with them. Right on this note, there is also a project that is called uh, Open Insulin, where people are actually making insulin monitors and trying to make their own insulin um, because like price surges of insulin in the US right now, for instance, are crazy. And a lot of people are really having bad times managing to get their hands on the proper insulin that they need and so on. And so this also empowers people to say, you know what, like we are not going to take this nonsense anymore and we're going to do it our own way. Um, and there are many, many other projects, right? Just a little bit of data on something that we're working on at the moment, which is, um, this is something that we're working. But just to show you that what we're seeing here is the number, like the fraction of papers as a percentage of total publications from PubMed over time from the 1990s to 2020 uh, of papers that had either open source hardware, open hardware or open labware in their abstract title or keywords, right? So you can see that this is not growing. I mean, it's still a tiny, tiny fraction of the total number of papers, of course. But what I like here is how fast new, new papers are coming more and more each year. Um, if people are interested in this, I would really recommend taking a look at the GOSH community, which is the global open science hardware community, which is mainly where Huli, Alex and I met. But the point that I like to make here is that this is a really, really global online community most of the time, where people really from all continents are discussing open hardware. They're really, really open to newcomers and really willing to help with questions. And there is, I think, the most important document that was done collectively, as you can see on the photo on the bottom right, like this was the voting for things in the manifesto that we wrote. It's like, what is the point of the global open science hardware community and what is our manifesto, right? And you can see the points highlighted here. Um, and this tries to make sure that this is, is and still keeps going as uh, a really diverse and horizontal community where things are being discussed and all of these different communities are being taken in consideration. Um, again, I can share the link for this if I did not this yet. I have a slide in the end with useful links. This might be there. Um, a little bit of a shameless advert, I'm sorry. So we are actually finishing um, the curriculum for our new program and you can pre-register at if you go to openhardware.space and you can also find more uh, information about this. And the idea of this program is to take people that are newcomers into open hardware and to show them best practices, right? So you're gonna cover a lot of things that are quite similar in terms of like, oh, this is GitHub or this is Instructables and these are all these platforms. But also like we're gonna show like points on documentation and licenses and things because hardware, believe it or not, most of hardware projects need at least three different licenses. <laughs> which is different from all the projects that we've been discussing right now. Uh, but yeah, so I just wanted to say, please take a look at the website, get in touch if you want. Like we will be super, super happy to get projects uh, or even just questions from you because we are in the moment where we're finalizing our curriculum and we're ready to launch hopefully in another couple of months uh, and then still run a cohort this year. Um, with that, I would like to say thanks. You can ask me questions. I think you're writing, hopefully, uh, in the document. Uh, you can find me on Twitter. You can send me an email as well. I'd be super happy to chat. Um, and just to say that here is a list of what I think are useful links. 
and the presentation is available also on the document. I hope I didn't go over time, uh, but this is mostly of what I had to share today. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Andre. Um, we have one question, but I'm just going to announce that we are top of the hour. If you have to drop off, please feel free to drop off. Uh, but, but there is one single assignment which is new, which is about breaking down your milestones into smaller minds, milestones. Uh, beside that, there, everything is a repetition from last cohort calls that we ask you to develop your documentation, try to launch your website whenever you're, whenever you can. So back to Andre uh, for folks who are still sticking around. So first of all, there's a huge, there's a beautiful comment which says, "I love how open hardware can really unleash everyone's creativity." And every time this talk happens in our call, people see it for the first time. And it really, you know, it is, it is something that we don't talk about enough. So I'm really glad that you could come and talk about it. We have one question which says, I'm blown away by the mini microscope. Can I ask if you came across something similar to for other hardware in the lab, such as plate readers or thermal cycler for PCR? Absolutely. So um, one thing that I started doing when I got back into this path a long time ago is if you have a Google for open source and then the piece of equipment that you need, you most likely, and this is really, really cool, you're going to find somebody who has some sort of a project uh, to do exactly what you wanted to do already, right? And so, for instance, there is a very famous PCR named OpenPCR, and this inspired other um, projects. And um, it's really much cheaper than, than regular PCR machines. What I also wanted to say is that COVID has enlisted a lot of people working on real-time PCR machines that are open source for detection and, and testing and so on. So there are a lot of these projects now available online as well. Um, what was the other equipment? Ah, um, plate readers and so on, yeah. So all of these, I think they're available. Um, it's a matter of looking for this. And on the links that I sent, there is the Open Hardware Observatory where you have a lot of uh, projects that are there. There are actually, sorry, I'm going on and on, but there are actually like $5 PCR machines available where you do like one PCR, like what would be the equivalent of one Eppendorf tube at a time, but still like this is $5, right? And so if you don't need to do like 96 plates at like 96 well plates at the, like as a regular, like this could be enough for you, right? So I'm going to post the link that Andre just talked about. There's a project directory where different uh, protocols for hardware are there, as I believe. Yeah. OK. Thanks so much, Andre. That was wonderful. And thank you, everybody, for being here. Andre, you're not yet in the Slack, but I'll add you. And I hope people can reach out to you if, if needed. Yeah, okay, wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. Thank, thank you. you so much, everyone. Uh, Amy and I, I are going to stick around for five more minutes. So. I'm going to stop recording, but uh, if you have any.